Welcome back to our lecture series, Linear Algebra Done Openly. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. We are starting chapter four in our series entitled Orthogonality. Now that might sound like a made up word and basically every word in linear algebra sounds like that sometimes, but no, this is a topic we're gonna to talk about a lot in chapter four. This chapter is gonna be very, very geometric in its nature. We want to develop some of the geometric framework of lengths, and angles uh, through the lens of linear algebra. This leads towards ideas in geometry, higher geometry, uh, trigonometry, and things like that. So we've dealt with geometric issues in this course already. So while the notions of affine geometry were introduced as early as chapter two, um, and there were some geometric threads that were woven inside of chapter one or introductory chapter, uh, the, the notions of affine geometry are very, very broad, and we want to focus more on what's called Euclidean geometry. Um, and as such, this geometric development will not be entirely possible for all of the finite fields or other fields we've talked about. Uh, there's going to be some limitations that one can make. While there are some geometric analogs that can be made, um, they're going to be somewhat restrictive and limited, and so for simplicity's sake, in chapter four, we're gonna we're going to resolve ourselves to only talk about the fields R and C. So the real numbers and the complex numbers. These are the only two fields we want to worry about uh, for this chapter because that's the setting for which the full blown orthogonality conditions can be made. Now again, I don't want to say things like dot products and norms have no places for other fields. I mean, in the finite field Z2, you have the Hamming metric, the Hamming norm, which is a very good way of measuring distance on binary vectors. But again, it won't have all of the same meanings. Uh, so like this, the positive definite condition and things, there's a lot of stuff that will, would be technical that we don't want to get into in this series. So it kind of goes beyond the scope of our course, those, those analogs there. So we are going to restrict our attention to just the real numbers and the complex numbers as we talk about the subject of inner products. Now in this series, we there's really only two inner products we care to introduce, uh, the so-called dot product and the Hermitian product. And the inner product is the term we'll use to describe uh, either of those. There are lots of different inner products out there, but again, at this, at this first introductory level, the two inner products we care about are gonna be the dot product and the, uh, the Hermitian product. Now, the, re the, the dot product is the inner product, the sort of the canonical inner product for the real numbers, and we define that right now. Uh, so the dot product is gonna be a function which goes from Rn times Rn to just R. So what happens here is we take a vector in Rn, we combine it with another vector in Rn, and we produce just a scalar that is a number in Rn. So the, the, the dot product is sometimes called the scalar product because we're gonna multiply together vectors, yes, but we produce a scalar value. Be aware that prior to chapter four, we hadn't really developed a notion of multiplication of vectors. Now, yeah, we did have a matrix times a vector product, but in that situation, we really were just doing a special case of matrix multiplication, no notion of a vector multiplication. This chapter four will introduce, uh, and also in chapter five, will introduce many notions of vector products, the first of which is this inner product, or sometimes called the scalar product. It takes two vectors together and produces a scalar. Now the formula for the dot product is gonna be the following. We're gonna take u dot v, and so it gets the name dot product because the symbol we use to describe the dot product is actually a dot. There are lots of different notations one uses to describe multiplication. For the dot product, we always use a dot. We will see other types of products of vectors for which we'll use different symbols. So the dot product by definition is gonna be u transpose v. If we think of vectors as one column matrices, then the dot product is gonna be a row vector times a column vector, which we can see right here, a row vector and a column vector. Well, matrix multiplication tells us exactly what we do with this. If we have the same number of columns as we have number of rows, which in this situation means the two vectors have the same number of entries, which ought to be n, we're going to take all the possible combinations. So you're going to take u1 times v1 plus u2 times v2 plus u3 times v3 all the way down to un times vn. And that's what we mean by the dot product. It's a calculation we're probably quite used to because we see it all the time with matrix multiplication. I'll talk more about that in just a second. So if we take the dot product of u times v, 
And what this means is you're going to multiply together the corresponding components of the vectors and add them together. So we're going to multiply together the first entries. So we get 1 times negative 5. Then we add that to the product of the second coordinates, 2 times 0. Then we add that to the product of the third coordinates. We do these things. We get negative 5 uh, plus 0 plus 9. And so then the dot product turned out to be 4. What is the relevance of the dot product? What does this mean geometrically? We'll get into that. Don't worry about it. At the moment, let's just focus on computing these things. Uh, so let's see. So I mentioned the connection to matrix multiplication. Uh, honestly, as we have been multiplying matrices together, we really have been doing dot products all along. We just, we just didn't really mention it. Uh, so for example, if we have A uh, as an M by N matrix, then consider some vector X, right, in Rn. Well, consider the row vectors, not the column vectors, consider the row vectors of A. Okay, so we have the first row, the second row, the mth row all the way through. Well, when you multiply together a matrix by a vector, A times X, this really is just, we can view it as dot products. You take the product of R1, the first row times X, that's the first entry. Then the second entry is the dot product between R2 and X. And then this will go all the way down to Rm times X. So, you know, if we took as an example, one, two, three, four, five, six, just as our matrix, and then we take a vector, uh, we'll take it to be say zero, three, negative five, or something like that. We often talk about this finger multiplication, right? You take the first row times the first column. This is really just going to be the dot product of those two vectors. So we're gonna get one times zero plus two times three times three times negative, or sorry, plus three times negative five. You simplify that. Then you take the second row times the column here, and you see so you get four times zero plus five times three uh, plus six times negative five. So every time we do multiplication of vectors, we're essentially doing a dot product. And so for that, in that perspective, the dot product um, works for every vector space for any field. We can do dot products as long as we have some type of coordinate system. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Now, so while dot products work for every single vector space, the notion of an inner product is restrictive just to these reals and complex numbers. And the reason I say that is that the dot product will only be an inner product for the real vector spaces. Um, we can do dot products on other vector spaces, but it doesn't form an inner product. I'll, I'll, I'll explain the distinction of that in just a moment. Before we do that, I want to introduce the Hermitian product, which is the inner product for complex spaces. The problem is we could do a dot product. We could do a dot product, for example, of vectors in C2, C3, whatever, Cn. And let me give you an example of that real quickly. What if we took, uh, let's say, the vector u will be the vector 1i, for example, and v is going to be the vector, uh, I guess we'll take 1i again. You know, why not just make it the same thing? And so if we take u transpose v, uh, which was the dot product we defined previously, uh, this is going to look like 1 times 1, which is 1, plus i squared, i times i, which gives you 1 minus 1, which gives you 0. And so this is going to be a little bit concerning for us because essentially what we do, took is we took the product of a vector with itself. So this really here is just u transpose u right here. The dot product of vector equals, it equals 0. And the thing is we don't want that to happen for inner products. We don't want the product of a, the inner product of a vector with itself to be zero. Again, that'll make more sense by the end of this video. And so while real numbers have no problems with this, uh, complex numbers, we can see that if you take the product, uh, if you take the vector transpose itself, you can actually get zero. Now, part of the problem has to do with the transpose. You'll remember that we vowed never Never, never to use the transpose of a complex matrix for which if we think of a column vector, it's just a one column matrix. This was like the a forbidden sin. We've broken the unbreakable vow. Don't do that. This is really the problem. Transposes shouldn't be used with complex matrices. And it really has to do with the notion of inner products.
for the finite fields and some of these other fields that are besides the real numbers and the complex numbers. Again, there are issues. There are some ways of fixing it, but for the finite fields we've talked about, there's really no way of resolving this problem that the dot product can produce zeros when you take the dot product of that vector with itself. And therefore, it's not a good candidate for the inner product. So let's first talk about our candidate for inner products with complex matrices. So we should never, ever, ever use transposes. So to define an alternative to the dot product, we take the so-called Hermitian product. And the Hermitian product is gonna, be, we're gonna use the exact same notation, u dot v, yikes. I'll talk some more about that in a second. But instead of defining that to be u transpose v, we define that to be u star v, which this is the conjugate transpose. We transpose and we take conjugates. So what that would look like is we're gonna turn the first vector into a row vector, but we have to conjugate each of the scalars in that row vector. And then we multiply together the, the vectors using the usual finger multiplication. And so the Hermitian product will look like the product of u1 and v1, but you take the conjugate of u1. You'll take the product of u2, v2, but you take the conjugate of u2 all the way down to un times vn, but you take the conjugate of vn. Let me show you what that looks like. If we take the product, uh, the inner product, in this case, the Hermitian product of u and v, what that will look like will be the following. So u dot v, we take the conjugate of the first one. So it's going to be 1 plus i conjugate times i uh, times, excuse me, 1 plus i. Then we're going to add to that i bar times 2. And then we add to that 3 minus i bar times 4i. And if we go through the details of this, let's do the complex conjugates. It changes the sign. So you get 1 minus i times 1 plus i. Uh, you're going to get negative i times 2. So that's a negative 2i. And then you're going to get a 3 plus i times that by 4i. And if you FOIL out the 1 minus i times 1 plus i, you end up with a, uh, you're going to get a 1. I don't want to necessarily need all the details here, but why not, I guess. We get 1 minus i plus i uh, plus 1 because you get negative i times i. Uh, we're going to get a negative 2i. Uh, we're going to get then a 12i minus 4. You'll notice that these complex numbers cancel out right there, the i's. So cancel, you know, collecting real parts, we have 1, 1, negative 4. So that gives me 2 minus 4, which is going to be a negative 2. And then if we gather together the imaginary parts, we get a negative 2i plus 12i. That should add up to be 10i, positive 10i, like so. So we get the product, uh, we get this Hermitian product. You have to remember to take the conjugates here. Now, alternatively, if you do it the other way around, I do want to mention here, if you take v dot u, now you're going to take the conjugate of v because you're taking the conjugate of the first term there. So you're going to get 1 plus i bar times 1 plus i. Okay, well, the first entry of u and v is the same number, so you switch things around, you don't notice it. Now, if we take the next one, you're going to take 2 bar times i, and then for the last one, you're going to take 4i bar times 3 minus i, like so. Well, what happens when you take the conjugate of a real number? Well, you switch the sign of the imaginary part, but there is no imaginary part, so it actually just stays the same number. The conjugate of a real number is actually just a real number. Um, and so you're going to get 1 minus i times 1. I mean, it's the exact same real number is what I meant to say. Uh, so you're just going to get a 2i. You have the 1 minus i times 1 plus i. And then you're going to get minus 4i times 3 minus i and so distribute multiply these things out like we saw before one minus i times two i one plus i that's a two um, you're going to get a positive two i this time and distribute the negative four i you're going to get negative 12 i uh, plus four i uh, excuse me that's going to be a plus four uh, nope 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 let's be careful here so we're distributing this negative four i here so you get negative 4 times 3, that's the negative 12i. Then you're going to get, it's a double negative, great. So then you're going to get 4i squared, which like before, it's still a negative 1. So you're still going to get 2 minus 4, which is a negative 2. Uh, but this time you get a plus 2i minus 12i. So that actually gives you a negative 10i, like so. So if you switch around the Hermitian product, you'll notice that you actually get the conjugate of the number. They're not equal to each other, but they are conjugates. Uh, negative, two, uh, negative 2 plus 10i versus negative 2 minus 10i. And so when working with complex numbers, complex vectors, you need to make sure you take the Hermitian product, take the conjugate. But like I said, if you take the conjugate of a real number, it just gives you back the, the, the same real number. So really the dot product is just a special case of this Hermitian product. 
Uh, because when you if you if you have a real vector, it's both a real vector and a complex vector. Taking its context it doesn't do much of a difference. So really, the dot product we talked about before for, for real vectors is a special case of the Hermitian product we have in front of us. So why? Why the dot product? Why the Hermitian product? What's this big deal about inner products? Why do we need the conjugate? Why can't it just be zero sometimes? What's the issue? Well, let's talk about some properties of the so-called inner product. So the first thing I want to mention are the following four properties hold for the dot product or the Hermitian product. And so when I talk about inner products, you talk about inner products. Well, there's two ways to define inner products. One, an inner product is any bilinear form that satisfies these conditions right here. Uh, don't worry about that necessarily. But basically, this theorem could be taken as the definition of the inner product. Um, what we're going to interpret it is as the following. An inner product is going to be the dot product when you're on the vector space Rn. And it's going to be the Hermitian product when you're on Cn. That's what we're going to define to be the inner product. And the reason we're, we're allowed to do that is because these two operations, dot product and Hermitian product, will have these conditions. So the first thing we want about an inner product is we want the inner product to distribute. So if you have a sum of vectors, then u dot v plus w, the dot product, the Hermitian product, or in general, the inner product distributes over vector addition. That's what we want. Uh, we also want some type of compatibility between the scalar multiplication we already had with this new inner multiplication that we've just defined. Um, and so, for example, if you have a scalar multiple as your second factor inside of an inner product, that is the same thing as c times u dot v. Now, let's be careful what's going on here. So this is a scalar times a vector, and then we take two vectors multiply together. This right here is a scalar, u dot v is a scalar, and you times that by a scalar. So this is just a product in the field. We want those two things to be the same thing, okay? Uh, you'll notice I didn't say... I didn't say anything about the first factor, and that's because we actually have to distinguish between the two. When you're talking about real numbers, for the real numbers, if you have c u dot v, that in fact is going to equal c times u, v, u dot v. There's no distinction there. But when you have complex numbers, you do have to be a little bit more careful. Um, with complex numbers, if you have c u dot v, this is actually equal to c bar u dot v. So you take conjugates on the first factor. And remember c bar here, uh, that would, that, that's just the usual conjugate of the complex number. So factoring a scalar out of the second factor in an inner product gives you back the original scalar. Now factoring a, factoring a scalar out of the first factor uh, gives you the conjugate. Now that's, that's really not a difference for the real numbers because if you take the conjugate of a real number, it's back to the same number again, no big deal. So really this is the principle we want. Taking away from the second factor is the same. Taking away from the first factor takes conjugation, just like the Hermitian product did. All right. The other thing we want is that if you take a product of, uh, if you take the inner product, it commutes. But this is also somewhat of a fib. Um, this right here, this is actually true for real vector spaces, u dot v is equal to v dot u. For complex vector spaces, we get something a little bit different. And what that is, is actually when you twist things around, v dot u is actually equal to u dot v conjugate. Because again, this inner product is a scalar. And if you twist if you twist the inner product around, you have to take conjugations. Now, of course, for a real number, the, since it's equal to its own conjugate, you get v dot u equals u dot v. Everything we're saying right now about real numbers is just a special case of the complex numbers. Now, if you were to take properties one, two, and three, this is true for the dot product over any vector space, the complex numbers, the finite fields, any of them. Why did we need the conjugates for complex numbers? And why can't we just do this for any vector space because the dot product formula makes sense for any column vectors this is this is the reason so these first these first three properties right this is some type of like distributive law uh, that seems to be working for the uh, for the the inner product here there's some type of uh, compatibility condition you could say like this is some type of associative property uh, oftentimes this is called homogeneity um, and then this last condition right here, this is some type of like commutative property, or you might call it the symmetric property. 
Uh, now for complex numbers, since it's not purely commutative, you might actually say it's like skew commutative. Uh, because it's almost commutative, but there's this conjugation that comes into play uh, when you do it for complex numbers. All right. So again, those are properties that hold for the dot product in general. Why do we need the conjugates for complex and why can't we do this for finite fields as well? Why, why so exclusive? Why so segre segregatory in this one here? And that's this last condition. This last condition, number four here, this is commonly referred to as the positive definite condition. Uh, the positive definite condition which it's really two properties for the price of one. So the first one is naturally the positive condition. So we want that u dot u is greater than or equal to zero. This is a scalar. Um, and so we want the scalar to be positive. And this is one of the problems we're gonna have for the finite fields for the complex numbers. We need to guarantee that this thing is greater than or equal to zero. That's, that's, that's really the positive condition. Then the definite condition is the second part. u dot u equals zero if and only if u is zero in the first place. We only want the inner product of two of the vector with itself to be zero when you have the zero vector. We already saw a counterexample that with the complex vectors, the dot product can produce zero, even if the vector's not zero. The Hermitian product, uh -huh, it won't do that. And so that's why for complex numbers, we assign the Hermitian product as the inner product. Dot products for real numbers is perfectly fine. And for finite fields, we also have this problem. We cannot construct a function that mimics you know, properties one, two, and three, but also gets uh, this positive definite condition. So the positive definite condition is the motivation on why we are restricting our attention to only the real numbers and only the complex numbers. And in the complex number case, why do we have the conjugate, the, the conjugate transpose there? We have to do it because of this positive definite condition. So before closing this video, I do wanna say one thing about why is it the inner product? What, what does that even mean? Uh, there's a lot of reasons why uh, people call it the inner product. I mean, it's in, it's in contrast to the outer product, which we'll define in a future lecture, uh, for which the, you know, the, the inner product goes into the field, you produce a scalar, the outer product will produce a matrix, a linear transformation. There's a lot of reasons that you could try to think about uh, by analog. There's some type of parable going on here. But the way I like to think of the following, when you define the inner product, uh, you get this, U transpose V. When you define the outer product, again, this is something we'll talk about in a future lecture. This is defined to be U V transpose. So in my opinion, it's the location of the transpose. Is the transpose inside or outside of the pair? And you know, is that the reason why people originally started saying inner and outer product? Probably not, but it's a nice mnemonic device to help you. If the T is on the inside, it's an inner product. If the T is on the outside, it's an outer product. And we'll see the outer product later in this chapter.